Hey, yo, from the kingdom of Ohio, you are listening to Old Culture. I am your host, Ryan Peverly. Welcome to the show. Thanks for kicking it with the only podcast that can quest like a tribe does. And we are all the way live with this one. That's because we welcome an old friend back into the house. Susie Chang returns to the show to talk about her life, her journey, and her new book, Tarot Correspondences, Ancient Secrets for Everyday Readers. Some of you surely know Susie as the co-host of the Fortune's Wheelhouse podcast, which I geek out on every Wednesday. And some of you may remember her first visit here back in episode 70 with her co-host, Mel Maline. For those of you who don't know Susie, she's a multi-talented artist and creator, many different areas of practice and expertise, and I think that that came through in the conversation you're about to hear And that conversation lives at the same intersection that some of my favorite chats live at. This nexus of idea sharing, personal introspection, and a healthy dose of fun and laughter. I mean, that is why we're sharing this space together to begin with. Anyway, enough of my nonsense. Let's get Susie Chang up on this mic so she can drop some of that raw, conscious lyricism on us. Enjoy. Susie Chang, oh, I don't know how to, what, just welcome back. It's so nice to hear your voice again. Oh, it's so great to be here, Ryan. I've been looking forward to this. I always like talking to you both on air and off. Yeah. You know, you were here last in episode 70 with your co-host and cohort on the Fortune's Wheelhouse podcast, Mel Moline, who I know is listening. So a shout out to Mel. Um, hey, Mel. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's okay. That's kind of a lie. You were actually here last in the Patreon version of episode 105. Oh, yeah, that's right. That's where, right. We did that fun thing. Yeah. yeah you, were, you were featured in a crucial scene in this year's uh, what I call Trap or Treat Halloween Spooktacular. Uh, really, <laughs> the scene that kicked off the whole story. So thank you for doing that. You were great. Oh, it was fun doing an audio cameo. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely, yeah. Well, to be honest, though, you were pretty much playing yourself. So uh, That's not, true. That's, not too much that's of a... Yeah. Not a well, stretch. Not a stretch at all. Absolutely. So, uh, Susie, let's do a little time hop, as the uh, people living in the past on Facebook like to call it. It's May 1997. All right? I am 13 years old. I don't know if that makes you feel old. <laughs> but... I'm 13. I'm at the end of my seventh grade year in school. I'm using a gateway computer that came to the house in a cow box to write papers on. I've just (laughs) discovered the internet and all the joys of illegally downloading my favorite music, as well as some other probably types of uh, entertainment, let's call it. And I've just got my first zit, probably, because the teenage acne struggle was real. Uh, But what, (laughs) what were you up to in May 1997? In May 1997, I was 27 years old, and I was working for Oxford University Press for the second time. I had started out there in New York as a young person, and then I had gone off to Cambridge University Press and worked for them for a while, and I'd come back. I was uh, editing, I guess, a combination of literary studies, African-American studies, American studies, classics kind of a hodgepodge of stuff. And the other thing that I was doing, I was trying out a lot of different things that, you know, I was having that sort of like, I'm 27 years old, I'm going to die soon, so I might as well just do everything. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So I was, um, I was ballroom dancing a ton at the time. I had broken up with a guy who I dated for three and a half years, who was a ballroom dancer. We were really good together as dancers and really terrible as a couple. And uh, we were, we were even filmed for this ballroom documentary at one point, but I digress. So anyway, so there was that and I was learning to play the saxophone and I was really kind of struggling to figure out who I was, you know, it was like, okay, I've, I was the kind of person who was always dating somebody, serial monogamous type, And so I was in between guys, and I was also really not sure what I was doing at work. You know, I was able to do the job, and I was pretty good at it. I liked meeting people and talking about ideas, but I knew there was something more. And I remember that I would just, you know, I'd be pouring over these manuscripts and trying to mark them up, and it would be a beautiful day outside in New York. And I'd be like, what am I doing in here? you know, life is going on outside. It's so much bigger than this. 
And, uh, and I really felt like I was living, like there's a disconnect between the life of the mind and the life of the body, which was probably why I was, you know, dancing three or four hours a night and, uh, and learning to cook. So I felt like, I, I like to think of it in retrospect as sort of not being able to deal with the lack of connection between the parts of myself and myself and the rest of the world. It was, you know, kind of a little cute little mini existential crisis. <laughs> yeah, As you will. Yeah. You know, yeah. When things when things seem like they matter a great deal more than they do. But it was right about then that I decided that I was going to learn to read tarot. Just one more thing, right? Just one more thing that people told you was pointless that you might as well do because you only live once. So yeah, it was May 4th, I think, when I decided to do it. And or was it May? Uh, well, anyway, it was, uh, it was in that first week of May and I decided that I was going to do it. I wrote it in my diary. That's how I know. And then the next day, I just went to the Barnes & Noble on probably, hmm, I don't think it was Union Square in New York. I think it was, they used to have one on like 7th Avenue or something like that, 8th Avenue on the West Side. And I just went and I bought myself a tarot deck because what the hell, right? And I didn't know what I was doing, but I just sort of plunged in and I sat with the cards and I just remember that that first day that I had them, it was really weird because it was like I was holding the cards and I felt this kind of, I don't know, it was like I was holding something that was electrically charged in my hands, you know, almost like I was touching a radio or something that was receiving a signal. And it was really weird because, you know, I was the kind of person who is very much a atheist materialist and, and there's zero reason why this should be happening, right? So, yeah, and that's when I started wondering if there might be something more to all of this. So you picked up the deck. What deck was it? Was it the Rider Waite Smith or something else? It was just a plain old Rider Waite Smith. I still have it. You know, the one that first came out in the 1970s with the kind of, you know, garish, bright cartoon coloration and the sort of tartan backs on them. You probably have one, right? I do have that same exact deck. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to be honest, it's the, <laughs> it's the only tarot deck I own. I just mm. I haven't gotten into deck collecting or working with other decks to this point, but that's something we could talk about later. Yeah, yeah. And just for the listener's sake, the reason I brought this up was because you do mention this in the book, you know, that you first discovered tarot in 1997. You actually did privately share with me the actual journal entry from your personal journal that had that May 4th <laughs> yeah. date on there. I thought that was really cool. You actually have kept that all this time and you went back to reference it when I asked you something about that date exactly. So, you know, there's yeah. another part of this too. I want to know about this tarot school. You went to something called the Tarot School? Is that is that the real name? Oh, of it? yeah. So I think they're still called that. This is um Ruth and Wald Amberstone. They're kind of eminent screes in the tarot world. They've been doing they've been teaching tarot forever. They're wonderful. And so they had the tarot school was not actually that old at that time. And of course, you know, if you wanted to find other tarot people, you would go on the internet, but it wasn't, as you know, in 1997, it wasn't like it is today at all. So you would, you know, you would find Usenet groups or you would find forums or whatever. And it's not like anyone could actually show you the image of the tarot card they were looking at. <laughs> but then, uh, so, so yeah, the tarot school is this, I guess it was then, I'm not sure what the form it takes now is, but it was a weekly meeting group that you could go to and just talk tarot and learn from Ruth and Wald, who were not yet then married, I think, but are now. And it was just a way of finding the others, you know? Nowadays, Ruth and Wald have a wonderful conference that they hold every year called Reader's Studio. And it is just a marvelous gathering in New York of tarot readers from all over the world and, you know, all over the country, all over the world, and get together for three days and just talk and commune about tarot. It's pretty great. So they're still doing that. Yeah. And what was it about that experience that stood out to you? Like, is that when you really started to process that you knew that tarot was for you? Not really. I mean, I think the tarot school, you know, I'm the kind of person who's just not that great at learning from other people. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm an autodidact and I really, and with tarot more than anything else, it wasn't just like you could read books or have somebody tell you, 
you really have to do the work yourself to be able to speak and breathe and learn tarot. So, which is ironic because now, you know, 21 years later, I have this class, which I'm holding and, you know, and I, I, I had many doubts for all these years, whether it is even possible to teach someone to read tarot. But now I believe that you can show someone how to teach themselves. And so that's what I had to do, really. You know, I really had to just work with the cards constantly. And it wasn't so much about memorizing meanings, which I don't believe anyone has to do. And it wasn't so much about learning to interpret. The biggest issue for me was just getting over the doubt, right? Just the idea, getting out of my own way, getting out of, getting out of that idea that this can't possibly work. And there's this moment sort of like, what are you doing? You know, so it took a real long time for me to get out of that headspace. And I think what did it for me was, well, I I read for everyone I could. I read for friends. I had like a a Tuesday gig at a coffee shop just for fun where I would kind of work for tips and uh, people would come. And it was interesting because this was I was living in the theater district in Hell's Kitchen in New York. And there's some real interesting people there. (laughs) So, you know, they would come and tell me their stories and I would read for them. And and I really got the, I guess that's when I really got the bug. And I think I might've told you this story in the previous episode, but one of those times when I was really struggling with, with my doubt with tarot, I had um, asked the cards if I should just give up, you know, because Uh, I wasn't really quite sure what I was doing. I wasn't really getting all that much out of it. And I drew two cards. I drew the strength card and the magician card. And those two cards, as I probably explained before, have um, infinity symbols over the heads of the two figures in the center of the card. And those are the only two cards, unless you uh, count the two of pentacles, which also has an infinity symbol implied on it. Those are the only two cards that have that really just clearly marked out like that. And I took that as a message that, no, I I probably shouldn't give up because everything was possible. Nowadays, I would look back at the the magician and see that as as a message from Mercury because he's associated with Mercury. But I didn't know that then. You know, Mercury is a a real, real big fucking deal for me. But (laughs) um, I saw those two cards and there was something about just looking at them the way they hit my eyes. That felt, you know, as Jung might say, as a it felt like a person, a personally meaningful coincidence, a synchronicity, and that's I remember what caused me to stick with it. Well, clearly that has put you on the path that led you to this moment right here with the publication of your first tarot book, Tarot Correspondences: Ancient Secrets for Everyday Readers. And bringing in the Fortunes of Wheelhouse podcast as well, what came first, the idea for the podcast or for the book? Because obviously they are, <laughs> I think you call them esoteric twins, and the projects definitely seem to have unfolded concurrently. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my whole like tarot life is kind of exploded in 2015. Um, I had, as I mentioned before, kind of been creeping along in the tarot closet for decades, you know, just kind of reading for friends and trying to be responsible with other careers. I'm a food writer. I teach writing. I do a bunch of other stuff. But in 2015, I, uh, it, was, it was almost like rediscovering the internet all over again, because I remember it was like between Christmas and New Year's of 2014 that, you know, I was taking a break from work and I thought, oh, I'm just going to piss around on and look and see if there are other people who read tarot on the internet, <laughs> which obviously there were, you know, sure. tons. There was this huge Facebook group and lots of them. So I got involved in that and I started just talking tarot to people all the time. And the first thing that sort of got me back into tarot was the first sort of public face I put on tarot was, was actually those cases I make, the Arcana cases. I started making these silk and brocade cases which I sew just on my sewing machine. But it was like, okay, this is a thing I can do in tarot that doesn't seem too suspect. It's just a product. It's a physical product. It doesn't mean that I have to, you know, say I'm a tarot reader. (laughs) I just provide this service for people. (laughs) So, (laughs) So that started, I started selling those. And then I guess in the course of being in the tarot community, my friend, my closest friend in tarot, who is a guy who lives in um, 
in Australia, he introduced me to Mel. Mel had Mel Moline, who is the creator of the Rosetta and Tabula Mundi tarots. So she had at that point just produced what's called the Knox at Lux edition of the Tabula Mundi tarot. It's black and white. It's, you know, just drop dead elegant and absolutely stunning deck. And so I got really into that. And as it turned out, she didn't live that far away from me just 45 minutes away. And so I started talking to her and I guess, I guess it was sort of like all in the same year, I started deciding that I was going to try and go to Reader's Studio with my decks. I decided that, I guess I discovered podcasts and you know how it is when you first discover podcasts that you like look for all of your favorite topics and see if there's a oh, podcast yeah. on them. Definitely. <laughs> And yet, you know, I was looking through the tarot podcasts and and I thought, you know, somebody's got to have gone card by card through the entire deck and had something to say about every card. And that wasn't actually true at the time. There were a couple who had done, I saw one that sort of left off after, I don't know, 20, 30 episodes. There's some people who have gone through the majors, which is fantastic. I know Andrew McGregor's done a really wonderful series on the majors with James Wells, I think. I don't think it's a publicly available podcast, though. I think that that's available through his site. And there's been a couple of other people who did that, but nobody had gone through each card symbol by symbol in a way that could unpack it for anybody. Because there's so much stuff in there. You know, there's so much stuff that's just hidden in the Rider Waite Smith and Thoth Tarot's, which is what we started with. And I thought, you know, I would really like that. You know, I would really like to study that and find out what's going on in those. And, you know, since I had already started podcasting myself, I had a little podcast called The Level Teaspoon for a couple of years that was just cookbook reviews, which is one of the things I do. I thought, well, you know, why not make a podcast out of it? And of course, I needed somebody to do it with because me talking, monologuing for 45 minutes would be terrible. And I didn't really know enough. And that's when I decided to ask Mel. So that's how Mel got sort of in the picture. And she, you know, and amazingly enough, she said, yes, I've always been very grateful for that. And, uh, and we somehow have managed to keep going with this incredibly, you know, epic project, really. We're up to episode 65 now. We've never missed a week. And we've, you know, just keep going straight through till episode 77. And then who knows what'll happen with that. But the reason the book got started is because, you know, I was working on putting together all these charts all the time, just out of my own personal study of the cards and the correspondences therein, the numerological, elemental, cabalistic, astrological correspondences. We were talking about them in each episode. And it was getting to be, you know, it was really a pain to look them all up every single time, <laughs> you know, and gather all that information into one place so I could vomit it back up again for the for the podcast. And I thought it would be so much easier to just have it. Maybe there's a book. Well, there isn't a book. So I'm going to do the book. So that's how that happened. I decided I was going to just like get all of this material together into a book. And when I was talking to Barbara Moore about it, she's the editor at Llewellyn who picked it up. It was clear to me that as a person who worked in publishing for a lot of years, that a book of charts is you know, it's fine, but not enough because anyone can look up this stuff if they're even a little bit as nerdy as I am. And even though it's nice to have it in one place, I feel like I have more to say than just giving people a book of charts. So I started figuring out how I was going to present the book as a guide to using the correspondences in your actual practice, what you can do with them, some of the tricks that people use in interpretation. And of course, you know, once you start doing that, once you get involved in correspondences of any kind, you're involved in magic. You know, you can't study the correspondences without getting involved in magic. Uh, so that's become a much bigger part of my life now. And it also became, uh, writing the book became kind of a sideways inspiration for starting this tarot class, which actually started the same week the book came out. Because I realized that, you know, by if, by issuing this book that's very, very left-brained, I kind of needed to create a corrective to that. 
you know, because tarot is is an art that uses both the systematic parts of your brain and the intuitive parts of your brain. And I really wanted people to get a sense of how they could not only use tarot in an intuitive way, but derive their own correspondences by working with the cards and reading backwards from their own lives. I've done this before in other interviews, but I'll, I'll just explain a little bit the, the connection between the correspondences and using tarot like a normal person. <laughs> you know, because it's not like when you are walking around just Joe Schmo in your slippers and your bathrobe and making your coffee, you're thinking, oh, you know, this coffee is like the starry sea of Bina, <laughs> you know, or, you know, or that this coffee reminds me of Saturn and Capricorn or whatever, right? You're not in the esoteric headspace. But I really think that when you use a tarot deck, you have an opportunity to tie your entire life back into the cards. That's how tarot comes to life. It's a cosmological system like any system happens to be based on the number 78, but it includes everything in life, even the mundane stuff. And in order to be able to speak fluent tarot, it is a lot like learning a language. You know, it's like when you're learning a language, you start by maybe numbers. How are you? My name is, how do you get to the bathroom? <laughs> you know, and if you only know a few things, you really can't express yourself very well. So my aim is to be able to speak tarot so fluently that I can describe anything in my life. So for example, you probably, the thing you were doing before we got on the horn <laughs> was you were making coffee for yourself. And I was, yes. I was yeah, making coffee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and so off the top of your head, you probably don't have a card, a tarot card for making coffee, right? You know, you might have a card for like breaking up with someone, the three of swords or the five of cups. You know, you might have a card for, for getting a new job, like the six of pentacles or something. But most people don't have a card for making coffee, <laughs> you know, or just doing normal, ordinary things. And I think that it's important to do that because whenever we work with tarot, we're looking at our lives in the most sort of ordinary way possible. You know, it's not just about, if you draw a card a day, most people run into this problem if they draw a card a day, which is the fundamental practice in tarot. You end up you, you end up with sort of uh, astral fatigue real quick, because if you don't really speak fluent tarot, you're basically saying, well, this card means that I need to find balance in my life, or this card is a card about transformation, or this card is the manifestation of my will. And you know, what the fuck is that? <laughs> you, know? you know, it's like, <laughs> yeah. if you're just going to have an ordinary day when you go to work and you you know, and you talk to your friends, and you talk to your mom or whatever, that is not what you're seeing in the cards. And so people get disappointed and they walk away. I think it's important to be able to read ordinary things into the cards. And then that makes you more powerful as a reader for other people as well, because then you can sort of say, well, this card, it may be about, you know, transformation, or it may be about uh, harmony or whatever. But in your life, it's not going to look like that. It's going to look like, you know, you make up with a friend you haven't talked to for four years, right? It means that, you know, the tower doesn't mean that you have a divine breakthrough and, the, and a lightning bolt hits you on the head. It means that, you know, maybe you're thinking about something that you shouldn't be and you fall off, uh, fall off a set of stairs because you're distracted. You know, it's going to look like your real life looks. So what I think the correspondences are for are to help sort of make those connections so that you can figure out using the web of associations, the sort of neurome that you develop through all of these astrological, cabalistic, mythic, you know, content filled storehouses of knowledge to connect things to your actual life. Now, you know, so for example, for you and your coffee, 
I guess, depending on how you feel about your coffee, it could be that, you know, for you, making the coffee might be represented by the temperance card, for example, because temperance is esoterically the reconciliation of fire and water. It's got the fire on one side and the water on the other. You're heating the coffee, you're pouring water through it. It's kind of an alchemical process. Alchemy is associated with the temperance card, which is also known as the art card, art being another term for alchemy. It could be that you view it as the thing that helps you get from here to there, which is also appropriate for the temperance card because it is associated with the sign of Sagittarius, which is a sign of traveling, you know, and, and reaching from, for distant things with belief and faith which is what you do when you drink your coffee. <laughs> God you know, damn. So there's, a, there's a lot of different things that it could be. It also, it just looks yeah. like, you know, some dude pouring coffee from a pitcher into a cup. You know, there's just like all these different layers that it could be, right? <laughs> well, I did not think of making coffee. I, I've never equated that to any tarot cards. So the fact that you just went through that actually makes a lot of sense. It is it is an alchemical process, that is for sure. It definitely transmutes, you know, the lead of pre-coffee Ryan into the gold of post-coffee Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I don't know about that necessarily, but yeah. Yeah. It, I am a different person after a, a nice cup of coffee in the morning for sure. Let's talk about the systems of correspondence then that are in the book. You focus on four of them, the elements, astrology, number, and Kabbalah. And you wrote in the book that these correspondences lay hidden beneath the face of many decks, including even most contemporary ones. Often they are so well hidden that the deck creators themselves are unaware they're even using them. Yeah. Is that true? Is I mean, how is that possible that I could sit down and create a deck and not know that I am... I guess, sort of channeling or funneling these symbols or archetypes into my own art. <laughs> you could absolutely, because chances are that if you're a modern deck creator, you're familiar with the Rider-Waite-Smith deck. And this all comes down to Rider-Waite-Smith, right? And, you know, and the thing is that, like, some of the images in Rider-Waite-Smith, particularly in the majors, have a lot in common with the older decks, even the Marseille decks, which were not tied up to the esoteric information. But if you are going to be, say you, okay, so I'm trying to think where to start with this. So what happened with the Rider-Waite-Smith deck in 1909 was that it was, as probably many of your listeners know, it was the product of the work of the Golden Dawn Secret Society. And the Golden Dawn Secret Society was devoted to the work of esotericism. They were I don't know. They were kind of modern day Neoplatonists in that they kind of like to syncretize everything together, you know, and, and in the, in the initiatory process of creating a secret society, they brought in elements of mythology and, and knowledge traditions from lots of different sources. They used Egyptian sources. They used Greco Roman sources. They used Hebrew sources. You know, they used kind of whatever they did and they made this big sloppy mishmash. And that's what, that's what occultists do. You know, a lot of people have a problem with the Golden Dawn, but I just see it as something that all of us try to do in our search for truth. And, you know, we may do it in ways that some people appreciate and others don't, but the intention is the same. So they, they did this thing where they joined up every single card with all of the systems. So there's every single card has an astrological correspondence. It has a, obviously a numerological correspondence because, as you know, every card is numbered. It has an elemental correspondence and it has definitely a correspondence on the tree of life, the Kabbalistic tree of life. So, you know, so these were very deliberately encoded into the imagery of the Rider-Waite-Smith deck. And so, for example, I'm looking at the Nine of Pentacles right now and the astrological correspondence for that happens to be Venus and the second decan of Virgo. And if you look at her, she's got little Venus glyphs all over her, her dress. And she's standing in a garden with a wall. Venus happens to be in fall. In, that's a form of essential dignity where she's, she's not expressing herself at her strongest. She happens to be in fall in Virgo. So she's not doing the work of Venus in the same way. The work of Venus is to connect people, is to 
you know, is to create love and abundance and, and connections between people. And she's in a wall, you know, she's walled off from society. And one of the sort of small meanings of this card is that it's someone who is, you know, created a pleasant world for herself, but is isolated. You know, and if you draw a nine of pentacles card for yourself and you know anything about modern day tarot, you're probably going to draw a woman, you know, with this bird on her hand and and with inside a garden. You may not have the glyphs of Venus on the dress, but chances are you're going to have some kind of female figure, some kind of Venus figure. And chances are you're not going to even realize that unless you've studied this stuff that, you know, somebody deliberately was trying to invoke Venus with this card. So it's like if anybody picks up on the iconography of the card, they are of the cards in the Rider Waite Smith deck, they are definitely picking up on the symbolism that uh, Arthur Edward Waite meant to encode in there and which Pamela Coleman picked up both from his, you know, sort of deliberate conscious lecturing and just what she picked up just by being like a really powerful channel or something. You know, I think the language of the arts, visual language is it's something that bleeds through no matter what you do. The concepts are there. You know, every star card is going to have somebody pouring water on the land on, and the earth at the same time, which has to do with the sign of Aquarius. It's all there. And, you know, you'll see decks that get a little bit away from it. But ultimately, I call myself a lumper. I tend to see the commonalities in things, not the differences, mm. yeah. <laughs> for better or for worse. So tell us then... Why did you choose these four systems of correspondence in particular? I mean, are there others you could have used? And then also, how do they map to the tarot then? Just take us through that whole process there. So those four are the ones that are the most obvious. Like, they're the ones that are shared between the Rider-Waite-Smith and the Thoth deck, which both bring out of the Golden Dawn tradition. The Thoth deck, Alistair Crowley's deck, tends to actually have more systems embedded in it. For example, there's quite a bit of I Ching in there. There's a bit of geomancy in there. There's, you know, there's quite a bit more references to the alchemy stuff in there. But I wanted to sort of just start with the ones that are clearly shown or hidden or <laughs> clearly hidden <laughs> clearly, in yeah. those two decks, right? So which Mel and I have made a practice of trying to uncover. And that's something that pretty much anyone can find in any one of those decks without going too deep into it. So, yeah. So, okay. Well, number's pretty obvious. So that's, you know what? I probably should start with the hardest thing of all, which is Tree of Life. So the Tree of Life is the foundational diagram of Kabbalah. And Kabbalah is the system of Jewish mysticism, which the Golden Dawn took, and some might say distorted or corrupted to their own ends. Uh, there isn't a whole, you know, anyone who studies Jewish mysticism is not going to even recognize the way that the Golden Dawn uses the Tree of Life. However, the Tree of Life still looks like the Tree of Life. So what they did was, you know, the Tree of Life has this system of 10 spheres or sephirot connected by 22 paths. What else has 22? The major arcana. So every card has a place on the tree of life and corresponding Hebrew letter because the Hebrew alphabet happens to have 22 letters. Every number in, in the minor arcana, one through 10, obviously has a place on the tree of life because there are these 10, 10 spheres, each of which signifies something different. It's a kind of um, unfolding process of creation from one to 10. So when you're working with tarot, even if you don't specifically use a reference to the Kabbalah, you can think of it Think of the one to 10 cards as an unfolding process of creation from one to 10. And then the court cards also are assigned to the tree. They happen to go on the second, the third, the sixth, and the 10th sephirot. So it just sort of makes the symmetrical arrangement. Then the tree of life also has elemental correspondences, fire, water, air, earth. We have four suits. The four suits are joined up to fire, water, air, and earth. The 22 major arcana each have astrological, what we call ZEP correspondences, zodiac element planet correspondences. So there's 12 zodiac signs, seven planets traditionally, and three elements. Well, four, but we kind of do double duty with a couple of them. So you can assign each of those to a planet, an element, 
or zodiac sign. And then the minor arcana also have, there's 36 of two to 10 minor arcana, which means that every single one of those takes a third of a sign and is governed by a particular planet within that third of that sign, also known as a decan. So I guess that's the overview. It's it's not that hard to conceptualize. It's harder, you know, it's sort of like when you try to explain to someone how to tie their shoes, it sounds harder than it is. Uh, if you see it laid out representationally in a chart or table, it's actually pretty easy to see how this stuff works. Yeah, it definitely is. I mean, I hear you and Mel talk about this every week. And at some points, I feel like I just need to see it. Like, it's nice to hear you guys talk about it. I don't always have the deck with me or the cards in front of me when I'm listening. Mm -hmm. I obviously find that when I do, it's a lot easier to sort of comprehend the correspondences here. But to have that, these charts in this book where they are extensive charts. I mean, the book is more than 400 pages, and I would reckon that 300 some are the charts of the actual correspondences for all the cards with your commentary sort of built in throughout. And I just thought that was great. Like that's a, I think you said it earlier. It's nice to have it all in one place. I don't think a book like this exists to this point. So yeah, yeah, that's how I felt. I mean, I, I basically wanted to, I think maybe the the best reason to write a book is because you need it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I yeah. really needed this book. <laughs> in fact, it just lives on my desk because I use it as a reference all the time. It's just a lot easier than kind of digging into a whole bunch of source text or going down a Google wormhole. So, and I, and, and I think there's a lot of people out there, not everybody reads tarot this way, obviously, but there's a lot of people who will just look at this book and they say, ah, this is what I've been looking for. Because, you know, some of us extremely left-brained people just need to know if there's a system, how it works. <laughs> But, you know, but I really do believe that even for more right-brained people, learning a bit about the way these systems work will deepen your understanding of the cards. You don't have to memorize it because that's an insane thing to do that only those of us who are nuts about memory palaces will do. But, you know, in terms of like being able to find the connections between the real world and the cards, I really think that we need help. <laughs> we need help. Those of us particularly who are not psychic, who don't channel this stuff, you know, who can't just say, look at the four of cups and see that great aunt uncle Marty's trying to tell you something, you know, <laughs> we need ways of connecting the cards to what we know and are familiar with in life. You know, that's a great point. And I had a question on that I was going to ask later, but I'll ask it now. How mm -hmm. has tarot or has it at all, I guess, shaped the way that you process information off the card in your everyday reality? Are you more in tune with symbols and colors and sounds, etc., from working through this process of learning these correspondences? Like when you, I don't know, like when you go grocery shopping and you see something specific that, you know, you think, okay, well, that's a symbol that means this, and I should take it more seriously uh, because mm -hmm. of my, my tarot background, I guess. I probably don't lecture myself about it, but 100%. Yeah, you know, in the sense that like, so like, some of the things that will happen, this is, I think that once you start aligning yourself with a system of knowledge, you just start seeing it everywhere. I mean, it's, it's because we're pattern makers. And like, if you say, listen to one band all the time, you'll see their lyrics sort of playing out, right? You know, in, um, in the grocery store or wherever you are, you'll, you'll see things that remind you of that in some way. So yeah, absolutely. That is, that's very, very true. You know, so I give an example at the end of the book. That's probably the best example I have of what's going on with that. So there's a card called the six of swords, otherwise known as the Lord of science. And it is associated with the planet Mercury. And it's associated with the planet Mercury in the sign of Aquarius. So I have this planetary practice, right, where on every single day it belongs to a different planet or god. And Wednesday happens to be the uh, day of Mercury, So, which is my favorite day. I am a Mercury native in that I'm a Virgo, very much a Virgo. And so Mercury is really my guy. And uh, so on Wednesdays, I had this... At the time, I was always doing my groceries on a Wednesday. And I don't know if you know how planetary hours work, but 
you know, if Wednesday is Mercury's day, he also has certain hours within that day. So it's sort of roughly every seven hours, you'll get another Mercury hour, another hour for a given planet. The first hour of the day with sunrise is Mercury, and then you'll get another one roughly seven hours later. So I was on the road at Mercury hour on Mercury day of Wednesday, you know, and I happened to go into a library and I had also drawn the the Six of Swords that day, which is a mercurial card. So I'd gone into the library and I had never gone to this library before in my life, but I needed to go hunt something down. And I'd looked it up online and I knew it was there. So I walk inside the library and the librarian whom I've never seen before is just sitting there struggling at a computer and sort of making exasperated sighing noises. <laughs> and she's working with an Excel spreadsheet. And she just looks at me and she says, do you know anything about Excel? And I'm like, do I know anything about Excel? Because, <laughs> you know, obviously I'm a spreadsheet nerd. So I sit down with her and I solve her problem in like under eight minutes. Eight is the number of Mercury. And I walk out of there with my book. So, you know, this is something that if I weren't sensitive to the alignments of the correspondences, and how they relate to real life, I probably would have thought nothing of, right? It is just something that happened. But because there is this awareness in my life that this is something that happened at the hour of Mercury, on the day of Mercury, while I was on the road, which is the province of Mercury, anytime you're on a journey, you're in Mercury's domain. You know, I am a Mercury native. I drew the Six of Swords. The Six of Swords is the Lord of Science, which relates to this kind of systematic knowledge. And, you know, and that I was able to help this person in this way. It seemed to me like it was like a, a, a perfect alignment of all of these things. And I describe this as living in the poem of your own life, right? This feeling that you fit in as a part of a greater picture where you can't even see the whole picture, but you know that you fit in. And that's a really great feeling. I, I can't really explain it other than to say that I feel like when things like that happened, which is pretty regular in my life, I feel like I belong. Hmm. Yeah, that is interesting. And now I understand why you post your podcast on Wednesdays. <laughs> well, yes, exactly. So the plan was to, since I'm a, I'm a mercurial native and Mel is a Jupiter native, the plan was to post for patrons on Wednesday and then for uh, everybody else on Thursday, because Thursday is Jupiter's day. But then we just kind of got started posting it all on Wednesday because, you know, it just sort of worked out with the schedule well. And then so the way we do it now is that we post on Wednesday, but I publicize on Thursday, which is also a Jupiterian thing. So there's sort of this Wednesday, Thursday, one, two that happens. Uh -huh. Yeah. The all other right. thing that's kind of funny is that <laughs> I was just thinking back to when I first met Mel and she was still working in an office back then. And she said, well, you know, uh, the way I have it, the way I've worked it out is I'm free on Thursdays. And uh, I, I don't, you know, I take, I don't take off the weekend like people normally do. I, my day off is Thursday and some other day. And I said, oh, is that because Thursday is the day of Jupiter? You know, and I knew she was a Sagittarius and she just looked at me like I had three heads and she's like, how did you know that? <laughs> Because <laughs> we had just sort of like, you know, gotten to know each other. But that's just the way we both think. Well, yeah, it's nice that you guys uh, found each other then. You guys are kindred spirits, yes. obviously. <laughs> Definitely. So, you know, something that you told me, Susie, in a private correspondence, uh, that might be a pun. Was it might that, be a pun. <laughs> was that, <laughs> yeah, you had this uh, great line about how divination and magic, you see that as going backstage. And then I read in your book and you used the same line and I was appalled to see our private <laughs> correspondence made it into your book. Well, you know, but I thought about that. I've been thinking a lot about that metaphor because I, I literally think about that every single day. I'm not even sure I came up with that myself. I'm pretty sure now that I picked it up from Neil Gaiman. <laughs> because okay, okay. I think there's a line in American Gods where Shadow's traveling with Odin and they take a shortcut through the backstage of reality. Is that possible? I, I don't know. That It just sort yeah, of, I, know. I know they take a shortcut and I think they call it going backstage. But anyway, regardless, you know, symbols belong to everybody. And I think the backstage is one of the absolute best metaphors I can come up with for what goes on in divination and magic. I really do believe that 
just behind, you know, the veil that everybody likes to talk about at this time of year, just behind that curtain is the other side of reality and that we have a chance to go there as practitioners of either divination or magic. And, and I really do think that, that both diviners and magicians can kind of learn each from what the other does. You know, I mean, I think magicians, magicians are, are wonderful people and I admire them greatly. I'm trying to become one. <laughs> and I think that one step that magicians sometimes omit is doing the divination before you do the working. So you know what's going to happen and whether you really want to do this thing. So I think that's something that magicians can learn from our side of the practice. And as diviners, we have so much to learn from magicians because, you know, one of the, I think, occupational hazards of being someone who works in divination is that it's possible to develop a sense of fatalism that things are just going to happen because you're, you're, you're looking at the future all the time and you're constantly seeing it happen. You know, so I really believe that it's important to remember, especially if you read for other people, that there's always something you can do. There's always some kind of negotiation with free will that you can do while you're backstage. Now, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Miguel Connor, because I think it's an interesting one. It's kind of a dumb way to, to think about this, but I think it's kind of also kind of cool. So if you imagine a dial from zero to 10, where, or let's say from one to 10, where one means that everything in life is completely faded and 10 means everything in life is completely up to your own, subject to your own free will. Where do you place that dial? Where do you think your personal combination of fate and free will falls? Oh man, that is a great question. I think I might steal that for all my guests now. <laughs> it's really okay. good, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, so here's the thing. I think that that changes throughout life based on your own experiences. I don't know if there's a set answer that I have. I could tell you that when I was younger, I thought probably 10 would be where my dial was. <laughs> but as I got older, wow. but as I got older, and as I've started to now, well, here's the thing. As I've started to learn more about what we're talking about here, I now see the patterns that are sort of placed in my life for me to pick up on. Now, I mm -hmm. don't know if they were there before and I wasn't picking up on them or if they only started to present themselves once I thought that there may be a pattern to my life in some way. So now, though, that dial is much closer to number one, but I would say it's probably at five most days where I think that it's an equal combination of fate and free will. Like, I think that there are fated things that are meant to happen to me, but the choices I make either, you know, postpone those things or bring them sooner than I might be ready for, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, I guess my own actions. Yeah, that's a really good answer. What are some of the sort of patterns that you're talking about that you see kind of playing out? Uh, this podcast isn't about me, Susie. <laughs> I'm doing the thing, aren't you? You are doing the thing. You're doing the podcast host thing. That's fine, though. Uh, okay, so well, I'll try to answer that. It's not like specific symbols or things like that. It's more just like my interactions with other people. You know, like, for example, the people that I'm interacting with, I'm meant to interact with at those moments because I'm supposed to take something from them that I'm looking for in real time. When you say supposed to, supposed to by whom? Who's directing that? I show? don't know. That's the probably more towards the the fate of the of the dial there, right? Like I I don't mm -hmm. know I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's part of me or a part of what's outside of me or a combination of both, maybe, you know, a, a guardian angel spirit of some sort. I don't know. But I just know that uh, I have found myself in positions now where I feel like I'm supposed to be. And if I look back on how I got there, I can see the patterns. It might not be a real time pattern recognition. It's more of in hindsight, like, oh, that thing happened. I saw that thing. I did that thing. And then this thing happened. And it all kind of syncs together for me now. I start to, to realize that I do have some sort of faded path, but like I said, how I get there is completely up to me. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. It's almost as if you're sensing the trajectory of the narrative of your life. 
you know? Yeah. Well, and that mermaid thing that I told you about off air that I, that I sort of tried to communicate in this, these October episodes (laughs) on Patreon, like, you know, I was running into a bunch of water symbolism and then mermaid and siren symbolism specifically in my own life. I mean, obviously we all go to Starbucks or we've all been to a Starbucks or seen one, Mm -hmm. one on every block, it seems now. So you're familiar with that symbol, whether you realize it or not, you might not know what it means exactly, but so I don't know if my frequent visits to my local Starbucks has begun to sort of (laughs) fuck with me in some way, but I began to see and have real interactions with people in my life who reflected that motif. And that's probably the most prevalent one this year recently for me that I could talk about. And also it it definitely was permeating my subconscious, Susie, because uh, I had dreams about mermaids and being lured to, you know, oceans and bodies of water. So, yeah. Well, you know, the funny thing is that today, the card, one of the two cards that I drew was the Queen of Cups, which is probably the most Mm mermaid-y card there is. And I was sort of looking through my massive spreadsheet database card of the day thing to see when I had gotten it before. And I I noticed that one of the times that I had gotten it before was when I was listening to your podcast and you were talking about the Queen of Cups. And I I can't remember exactly why you were talking about the Queen of Cups or whether it had to do with the mermaids or, you know, whatever. But there's something about that card, which to me seems very reflective of your experience. And, you know, and also the fact that as an interviewer, you know, I think I associate the Queen of Cups with kind of an, an empathy and a mirroring of other people. And I think that's kind of what you do as an interviewer. So I kind of associate that card with you. And you know, there's there's kind of a ping there for me. Definitely. And I am a Scorpio and a heavy Scorpio at that. I think I have four planets in Scorpio on my birth chart. Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So very, very, very fixed water here. So Yeah. And we are in the middle of we Scorpio. In, we are season in Scorpio here. time. So. We're in the yeah, in that yeah. season. Yeah. Things and the other thing that, here. you know, I was just thinking about with this whole patterns and reality kind of thing is that It does bleed through in ways that, you know, I'm starting to understand a little bit better because for the last almost a whole year, I've been keeping track of my dreams. And, Mm. you know, so I have a vast document now of, and I remember a little bit of my dreams every day. So, you know, I'm able to kind of put something down to kind of bring it to earth. But the the imagery I see in there, there's a lot of tarot imagery. And every once in a while, I actually see a tarot reading in my dream, (laughs) 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 you know, which is which is wild. It's sort of like, you know, mirrors within mirrors. But I, I definitely feel that from studying this stuff, my unconscious has decided that it's going to talk back to me in that language at some level. And that's a crazy, wonderful, wild, wild feeling. Yeah. And, you know, it's funny, too, to take it back to the mermaids. You know, the siren mermaid symbolism about being lured to your death, essentially, is what that what that means, yeah. right? And the Scorpio, the uh, the death card is associated with Scorpio, right? So yes, that's an interesting pattern or correlation there as well. Absolutely. You know, there there's many different kinds of death, of course, but one of the sort of metaphors I associate with the mermaid is, you know, the the death of the ego, the surrender of the self, you know, and the the sort of fascination with meeting your own death, you know, not exactly a death wish, but sort of understanding I think that when you, you know, that mermaid symbolism maybe for you has to do with wanting to dissolve into the the collective unconscious in a way, you know, to sort of find the connections between people at a really profound level, something like that. Mm. Yeah, I think I don't you know. would be right about that. That is something yeah. that I have struggled with the past couple of years, especially since I started the podcast, was trying to find some depth to the connections that I do have with people and wondering if like... Like, why am I attracted to certain people in a friendship way or a romantic way? Is there really depth there or is it just surface levels, you know, sort of synthetic artificial connection? Yeah, I think that there's really, really something real there and that it may not be what you think. For example, so this is something that I've struggled with my whole life. You know, I dream constantly. I dream about hundreds and hundreds of people, everybody I know, people I haven't known, celebrities, whatever. I see people all the time. And I, I've joked that like if, 
this is one of the reasons I'm kind of hard to reach in real life because I sort of feel like we're all caught up because <laughs> I talk to people all the time in dreams. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but one of the things that happens in dreams is that, you know, I have clearly have a, a, a very romantic or erotic way of conceptualizing my relationships with people because I'm constantly having romantic attachments or sexual attachments that come up in dreams. And I don't mistake those for something that needs to happen in real life, right? With all right. of these different people. God, that would be, that would be a horror show. <laughs> but, but there's something about, you know, my metaphorical language of connecting with other people that kind of shows me that something is going on that's very important to me. Like whether, you know, it might be that when somebody propositions me in a dream, and I feel good about that. It could be that I'm seeking validation in some way, that I'm seeking mm. approval, that I'm, you know, that my insecurities are, my dream makers addressing my insecurities by saying, no, I really do admire you. I really do think you're great, you know, or something like that. And so when I see the, when I have these dreams, I really believe that they point me towards some kind of larger truth about what I need to know about myself. And I think that might be the case for you as well. I think it is. I think it's, on some level, it is that, that ego death that you hear and read so much about in psychology and the occult. But, you know, it's not maybe not like a full-blown, like, kill all aspects of your ego. I think a little bit of ego is necessary and sort of oh, absolutely, in some way. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But it's, it's not letting that part of you control your life anymore. And I have definitely struggled with that as a Scorpio, obviously, for many, <laughs> many years, you know, just being sort of unaware of that. But... The older I get, like I said, the more that I talk to folks like you for this podcast here and just learn from you guys and, and what you're doing and what you're saying here, the more I feel like that that's, that's kind of the reason why I'm here right now, to sort of go through that process and yeah. destroy the grasp that it has had over me for so long. And I think that's why recently that that siren mermaid symbolism has popped up more prevalently for me. Because it's, yeah. it's time to do that, Susie. It's time, you know? <laughs> well, you know, and it's like, it's it's not an easy thing to do to consciously do that in your own life. You know, like right now, for me, kind of doing all tarot all the time, there's a part of me that really struggles with that because that's not how I was raised and it's not what I was raised to value. So I dream all the time about being back at in academic publishing and being, you know, fired from my job <laughs> or whatever, because obviously that's not what you do. You don't <laughs> engage in this sort of like the world of the occult and, you know, stuff that nobody really takes seriously in the academic world. But I think that that's, that's me trying to come to terms with it in the same way that you try, are trying to come to terms with your own surrender to the things you're interested in with your mermaid imagery. Oh, man. Yeah. You did a nice job of turning this conversation back on to me. So <laughs> that's fantastic. It was very, very slick. <laughs> so I'm very impressed by that maneuver there. So where is your fate versus free will dial dialed up to then? One to 10? Yeah. There. Yeah. This is really, really interesting because, well, that's, and in fact, I was going to talk about that too, when we were talking about it. And I meant to bring in this whole sort of theory of archetypes thing, because I feel like I'm both at zero and at 10, <laughs> you know, in the sense that absolutely something, you know, there, there is no doubt in my mind that something of a particular shape is fated to happen to me that can be discerned by someone who is working in this space. But at the same time, I believe that I have some choice as to how that's going to manifest, right? So like, you know, an astrologer would say that it, when you first have your Saturn return, which is something that everybody knows about, you know, you can, you can approach it in a way that makes it a better experience for you. Or if you, for example, another astrological thing everybody knows about, Mercury retrograde. If you're going through Mercury retrograde, there's advice for that, right? You can kind of take things a little bit slower. You can go over things from the past, work with memory, work with repairing communications. You know, there's, there's different ways to work with Mercury. So I believe that I have a certain amount of agency and free will in terms of how the shape of the thing that's coming down the pike takes form in my actual life. And so this is something I actually really do every single day with the spell work the card of the day spell that I do. So I believe that when I draw the card, no matter what happens, 
I'm going to see it manifest in my life. There's no wrong draw, right? The tarot is never wrong. And I never <laughs> did. I, I sent you that that silly Hitler vid- video I did, right? Where it's oh, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I have a line in there where I made made the Fuhrer say that, you know, we don't, we don't say that this is, you know, fear of change or fear of death. We don't say we accidentally drew wrong. And even though, you know, that was like a ridiculous satire thing that I did, it, it's, it's true. I, I really believe that if you draw the cards, they're the right cards, no matter what, even if you were like not concentrating, even if you were like, there was another card under it that actually looked better that you maybe meant to draw. No, the card you draw is the card you draw and it's meant to be. So no matter what, something is going to happen. And what I do when I draw those cards in the morning as part of my sort of larger ritual, I draw the cards and then I look at them and I use the correspondences to come up with a spell. And I use the spell to try and tweak the meanings towards something that I can live with. Like I have literally never written a spell for the Ten of Swords that says, you know, and now you fall down on the floor with 10 swords in your back because, <laughs> you know, that is not a meaning of the 10 of swords that I want to see, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, right. I'm going to, I'm going to use one of the other meanings of the 10 of swords and build it into my spell and try and figure out a way to work with that. I'm also going to pay real attention to things that don't happen just to me in my days, you know, perceptually our worlds are really huge. So like you draw the 10 of swords, you might end up, Listening to something on the topic of, well, for example, depression, because that's something that I strongly associate with the Ten of Swords. You might experience something that has that theme in it. It's not necessarily the thing that's going to happen to you personally directly. It's not all about you. (laughs) So, you know, so for example, I once, I got the Ten of Swords uh, the day that I went to the protest events after the Parkland shooting. And, you know, to me, that was very strongly, I got that 10 of swords and I thought, well, this has to do with trying to make meaning out of that horrible event where lots of people died. So, you know, and I, and I think that when you encounter something that resonates with that energy of the card you drew in the morning, then you pay attention to it. It's sort of like the card taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, there's something about this I want you to pay attention to. So, you know, I might be listening to a podcast that has the energy of the card in it, you know, or I might run into someone who's working on a project that has to do with it, you know, it could be content or something like that. Some days I deal with it as a sympathetic magic type thing. You know, I will say (laughs) instead of I get the nine of swords, which is also kind of a gnarly card, I will say, okay, nine of swords, meaning sympathetic magic, I'm going to make nine kebabs nine pork kebabs and I'm going to eat them, (laughs) you know, because that's (laughs) associated with pork in my system. But there's, there's different ways of working with it. And I believe that magically you have some choice as to how these things take form in your life. And that the more seriously you take it, the more meaning you get to draw out of it, if that makes sense. It does. And I think that is a, a great answer. Before we go, obviously tell people where they can find your book, your podcast, your tarot class, and anything else you want them to find of yours. <laughs> okay. So uh, the sort of source for everything that I'm doing is my website, www.tsusanchang.com. And uh, so that is sort of a central clearinghouse for all the different tarot things I do, but there are sort of other websites that you can also see. So So what I do there, there's a blog there. That's the only place where you can sign up for my online tarot class, The Living Tarot, which is a really a wonderful delivery system for learning tarot because it's on Google Classroom, which means that anyone anywhere in the world on any system can use it at any time. It's self-directed, but there's a ton of content on there and there is a social component. So, So it's kind of the best of all worlds that way. The book can be found anywhere where books are sold, online or in regular bookstores. It's more likely to be found in some of the smaller metaphysical bookstores than than in the larger ones, but you can always find it online. The podcast, of course, is called Fortune's Wheelhouse, and that is produced by myself and Mel Moline. And that uh, has its own Patreon page at www.patreon.com slash fortunes wheelhouse. And then let's see, there is the Arcana cases for all your tarot deck needs. Uh, I do them in all fabrics, all kinds of silks and brocades, any size, 
although there is a standard sort of Rider Waite Smith size. That's available as well as my Zodiac perfumes, which is another sort of magical thing I got involved in this year. You can buy perfumes for your sun sign, or you can get even custom perfumes for your sun, moon, and rising signs. That's all at www.etsy.com slash shop slash tarotista. And let's see, I'm trying to think if there's anything I've forgotten. <laughs> I kind of lose track of my stuff <laughs> yeah, because there's kind of, lot. it's kind of pro- proliferates all the time. But really, if you just go to www.tsusanchang.com, you'll, you'll find everything, including some of those wacky videos I put out every once in a while. I've, I've been doing this crazy series of Orphic hymns in Greek that are kind of spooky and wonderful and wild for those who are into that stuff. Definitely, yeah. And I need to have you back sometime to talk about just the perfumes, because that is a whole thing <laughs> that I want to learn more about. So, Oh, they're so cool. <laughs> I have a lot of fun with that. God, it's like I don't, I have like, this is all like work as hobby, you know, it's, it's a wonderful thing to love every last thing you do. And the thing is that, you know, I sometimes complain to people that I'm up every night till midnight working, but you know, it's not really working because <laughs> it's so much right? fun. <laughs> yeah. You could be in a cubicle in an office, you know, hating yourself every day. Like I am. So. <laughs> oh man, Ryan, <laughs> they won't be forever. We'll do a reading sometime and we'll figure out when you're getting out of there. <laughs> yes. Uh, I'd love it. I love it. All right. Well, Susie Chang, really appreciate your time. Look forward to chatting with you again sometime soon on Facebook or here, wherever. Thanks so much, Ryan. And there you have it. My thanks again to Susie Chang. Love her attitude and her personality and her perspective. Very grounded, very real. She's good people, man. One of the best I've met since embarking on this journey here. And I think, or I hope at least, all of that came through in this episode. And as you might expect, my favorite part was the dial of fate and free will. I really will steal that question and pose it to relevant guests, not gonna lie. Much like I ask certain folks what love is and what it has to do with this. Which I haven't asked anybody recently, now that I think about it. But what I want you to think about is, where is your dial of fate and free will set? I set mine at five because, you know, balance. But I really do feel like that's more in line with, well, just my own experiences, I guess. I can't deny the patterns that I see, whether they're put there by some divine source or guide, or whether it's me just creating patterns where there may be none, which I think is also possible. So maybe I'm hedging a bit by setting it at five, but really, you can't go wrong with a balance of anything. I'd like to think I have at least some control over my own experiences, and I think one of the tricks that gets played on folks in circles like this is the idea that everything is fated by the stars, or the cards, or the spirits, or the gods, or whatever else, and I just can't get fully on board with that. Things like tarot and astrology are fun, but if your excuse for being an asshole is your zodiac sign, well, maybe you need to go back and have a critical think or two about your life decisions. I don't think it's that simple, nor is it that complex. It's somewhere in between, and... You know, I'm really okay not knowing at this point. I just want to enjoy the ride, as the uh, late great Bill Hicks would call it. Anyway, in the Patreon extension, we talked about the switch of the order and number of the Strength and Justice cards in the tarot, why the Golden Dawn system is still the standard bearer in tarot and Western magic, the four temperaments in the tarot, personal favorite of mine there, back to balance, we talked about finding balance in the tarot as well, And then we ended the chat breaking down the correspondences in the Queen of Cups card. And a shout out to new patrons who hopefully enjoyed that extension. Henrik, Tim, Ryan, Andrew, Cindy, Lisa, Samuel, Zach, Laura, Bobby, Josh, Allie, Maria, Jason, Beach Freeman, Matt, Paul, and my favorite drummer, John Drums. You too can help support the growth of this show by signing up at patreon.com slash oldculture. It is, as they say in my hood, the place to be. And speaking of, I have some places to be, so I gots to get before I get got. Until next time, you've just been initiated into a culture. I am Ryan Peverly reminding you to love yourself, think for yourself, and question authority. I love you.
and this cassette.